Now, uh, I'm sitting between two friends of mine, which is an interesting position to be in. Mr. William Styron, whom I call Bill, and Mr. Ossie Davis, whom I call Ossie. And I'm committed to both of these people in many, many ways, and on, on many, many levels. Now, Bill, he's the white cat over here. <laughs> has written a novel called The Confessions of Nat Turner, which is um, <coughs> William Styron's study of a slave insurrection. According to me, it is also an indictment of a certain system which comes partly from the Old Testament. It's um, a very subtle attack on the ways, our sense of reality, and what we live by. Now, Bill Styron's not Turner. I'm not going to be with you very long. I'm just bear with me a moment. It is a confrontation with his history. And I'm going to say one other thing, and then I will leave it up to, and I will talk about Austin, and I'll leave it up to them. I must say, you know, that I have to speak, I must say the truth, I read, I read Bill's book not as uh, history at all. I read it as fiction, because that's where I read most history. And... <laughs> Any event, any event in any person occurring in time is the property of any novelist. My province, for example, speaking of myself, is the province of all human life. And no one can tell a writer what he can or cannot write, especially not another writer. That's A, that's speaking about Bill Styron. Now, why this is an interesting question and really a 20th century question, a question which has never really on this <coughs> level happened in the world before, according to me, is that Ossie is also right. Ossie is talking about the film. And that means that Ossie is talking about the system which created in the first place the chattel who became Nat Turner. And whereas Bill's novel is a more or less private act, and one's reaction to it is a more or less private thing. <coughs> what happens with this on screen, in what we like to call America's living room, a living room populated entirely by <coughs> Shirley Temples and Ronald Reagans and their really fearful offspring, <laughs> is another question altogether. Ossie is saying that if one believes William's version of Nat Turner. And bear in mind, we're talking on two different levels. On the one hand, a book, and on the other hand, a, something at the mercy of the popular, something as dangerous as Gone with the Wind. Ossie is saying that if we make that movie according to Bill's vision of that particular insurrectionist, thousands of the black people in this country will die. So, we are confronted on the one hand with a printed page, the private conscience, and on the other hand with the public screen, the public will. And I'll leave the floor open to Mr. William Styron, who wrote the book. And I will move back. Uh, thank you, James. Most eloquent introduction. Um, I don't know how to go about really getting into this. Uh, I'm not a I don't consider myself a public person. I consider myself a writer. And I think Jimmy Baldwin feels the same way about himself. 
therefore there's an element of extreme embarrassment in, in my whole presence here. I, I, I didn't want to be here, and I don't particularly want to be here now, <laughs> even more so. Uh, but I'm here, and um, I feel only that uh, whatever logic uh, dictates that I am here lies in the fact that, as Jimmy says, there, uh, unlike uh, most novels, uh, uh, this or most books, uh, this book has uh, done <coughs> uh, some extra, extremely extra literary things which have uh, struck some hideous nerve ends in the public consciousness, and therefore uh, I justify my presence here on that basis. Jimmy's also right when he says that a writer should be able to do anything he wants to uh, if he's writing what has come to be known in the canon as fiction. Fiction is not history. History is not fiction. To be sure, logic again compels that the writer, if he is an honest man, uh, tries to render his vision of history, if he's writing this kind of work, with as much, I would hesitate to say accuracy, because I don't think that a meticulous accuracy is all that important, but with as much truth as he is able to command. I think that, uh, again, I hope not overly defensively, uh, that the book I wrote is an honest book. Uh, certainly it is not, as has been called uh, by some people, a racist book, which I find a repellent phrase. Certainly its intention was not to, to grind axes, ideological or, or otherwise, but to portray uh, an era of history which uh, we are now beginning to understand uh, to our enormous heartbreak and misery was the most crucial era uh, that America uh, possessed. I took as a uh, paradigm of this era a man who actually lived, named Nat Turner, a man who to me represented uh, what the human spirit could achieve uh, in overcoming the most ruinous and despotic form of human bondage that men have ever imposed on other men. Uh, I conceived of him early as a hero. Uh, I consider him still a hero. Most of the readers of the book, most of the people who we call responsible critics, have felt that the heroism of the man came through. This includes, I might add, quite a few Negroes. Um, I did it as well as I could. I did it in a way which corresponded to my own vision of what uh, uh, Negro slavery was. And I must say, uh, 
it was with considerable astonishment that I found that um, after having written the book and after the book had been widely read, uh, that I, I recollected uh, Jimmy's great, one of his many great touchstones about the racial problem in America, where he said that um, after 300, well, uh, that, that 300 years had passed uh, during which a white man had been on the black man's back, get off my back. And I may be the, the only white man, I think, who has for six months felt that <laughs> the entire Negro race was on my back. Uh, and I, I found it uh, illustrative and, 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 and very moving because it, um, it has touched me deeply because I, I didn't realize what kind of a, a, a hornet's nest I was going to stir up. Now, this is all I'm going to say by way of an introduction to what might develop into a, a, a closer controversy. And I would then ask uh, Ossie Davis, that very fine representative of the arts, to, 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 to speak. The enormous presumption under which I appear tonight, one and that I <clears throat> dare take exception to a man in terms of a book that he has written while recognizing as a fellow artist his absolute right to take material and treat it as he thinks best for his purposes, also as a man not easily given to acceptance of censorship in any form. I'm also presumptuous in that I have cried out aloud against a motion picture, the script of which has not yet even been written. I was aware from the very beginning of my presumption and uh, I took it nonetheless, and I still take it. And I do not hesitate to confess the pain and anguish that attends both the making of the choice and the execution of it. And I think we might wisely remember that the choices we make, all of us, has the choices of any consequence of those choices which draw blood. And if any of you have already a religion or a code of ethics or a morality which has answered for you for all times all questions, I envy you. I have not. I must create answers out of my own suffering, anguish, and concern. But I have the the consolation that if, uh, if I am mistaken, if I am overreactive, it grows out of a real concern about the problems that face not only me, but Mr. Styron and all of us in our country, particularly in the questions of race. I would like to reiterate so that nobody here slightly entertains for the for the least moment, my commitment to the right of the poet, the artist, the writer, to fulfill his function as best he sees fit. My abhorrence at the idea of the interference of outside force or influence to change or to take control of an artistic work. I say that in the midst of Hollywood where it is no longer necessary to censor a writer, it is easier to buy him. I, I was moved to do what I have done and what I think I will continue to do by very deep considerations. 
But before I get to the depth of my own concern, I'd like to ask you to remember something that happened to me and to Jimmy Baldwin about a year or so ago, which reflects on exactly the situation which we find ourselves now. Mr. Baldwin and myself were advisors on the board of a magazine called The Liberator, which published an article that, though mild, had some of the tinges of anti-Semitism. Now, I didn't believe, nor do I believe that Jimmy believed that the magazine or the article constituted a clear and present danger to the interest of the Jewish community, the law and order of our state. Yet, so sensitive was he and I to the possibility that a wrong tack might be taken in our collective and individual struggle that we felt called upon to publicly take to task Dan Watts, the editor, and the magazine itself, because it was an article which could quite conceivably uh, be interpreted as anti-Semitic. The thing that motivated me in making the statement was the fear that the effects of the article could so affect human behavior that it would become destructive. My motives in what I do now are basically the same. It is not that I attack Mr. Styron's right to create what he wants to create out of Nat Turner. It is not that I attack Mr. Jewison and Mr. Wolpe and those who are involved in the possibilities of a motion picture. What I fear is that, given the circumstances of our case, that the interest of my people and the American people at large could possibly be affected in a negative sense, and for one particular reason. My basic objection to the book, not as art, but the book as social consequence, is the author's choice of one of Mr. Nat Turner's motivations and characteristics his love, his unrequited love for the young white maiden. And though I understand the possibility of such a circumstance and recognize that even with Nat Turner, it was not beyond the realm of possibility that he did love a white young maid. But what I am disturbed about is that this is one of the areas about which I fear my country can be most immediately psychotic and destructive. I have only to think back in the last hundred years to the more than 3,500 black men lynched in the South. The rationale of such activities being that these men constituted a threat to white womanhood. I do not believe any of us here, of course, identify with what happens in the South. And I'm sure we are ready to point the finger at those people who did those dastardly deeds. Yet it was in Los Angeles itself that Petula Clark inadvertently touched the black skin of Harry Belafonte and sent a shock wave throughout the entertainment industry. Are we that clear of our horror at the thought of a black male lusting after white flesh? Are we really? Have we really passed beyond that hang up in our consciousnesses, have we? Had we already solved the racial problem as we face it in this country, the whole question would be academic. I would read the book, like it or dislike it, and leave it at that. But have we solved our problem? Have we made up our minds as to what we intend to do with the huge surplus population for whom our economy no longer has any place and will never have any place as long as the country exists? Those thousands in Mississippi who can't even pick the cotton anymore, what are we going to do with those people? It is because I fear that under the circumstances, some of the choices my country will make might well be racist and fascist and quite destructive, that I react 
I possibly overreact to the possibility that this attitude, this act of the murder of the fair white maid by a black man magnified on the screen, I fear its consequence. Not among you who are literate people, who understand, who read, who have thought all of these consequences out and have ordered your responses, but among the masses who will be affected by what they see in a much different way, I fear, than those of us who know better. The possibility that this sexual monster, which we have not yet laid by, may raise his ugly head in terms of the film of Nat Turner is a real one with me. And coming as I do from the South, having myself been exposed to all of the sexuality in the Southern communities, the ambivalence, the attraction, the withdrawal, the hysteria, and all of these things, I all the more am sensitive to this as a possibility. In addition to that, I am a father with a daughter who is 17 years old, a son who is 16, another daughter who is 11. A part of my obligation to my children is that I construct for them some heroic figure that confers upon them a sense of their importance denied them by our racist boards of education, which to this day refuse to include even Mr. Styron's version of history and what is being taught to our black youngsters today. When I, I draw a lot on, from Jewish experience because the Jews have been relevant to the history of the black man for a long time. Although there is a tendency in the black community now to cease being black Jews and to become black Irishmen, and this explains a lot of the trouble we got in the go. There is, at present, as expressed in an article in the New York Times, concern in the Jewish community about the fact that 25, 30, 40 percent of the marriages in Jewish families <coughs> take place between youngsters who marry outside the religion. And you might say, so what? That's fine. Let it go. Forget it. It's, it's good to happen. But what does that mean to those who think that being a Jew is an important thing and that that thing should be continued? What must the Jews do to enable their children to want to marry Jews more than they want to marry the blondes they see associated with the, with the motor cars and the razor blades? They must find heroes and heroines among their own people who so clearly represent that which is positive and beautiful and healthy, that their children will look and say, aha, that is for me. And if this is true for the Jews, how much more must it be true for the blacks? I have two daughters for whom I must find husbands. That's a part of my responsibility. I do not throw them in the streets and say, root hog or die. I know that their possibilities of their marrying whites is extremely limited. I would like them to marry somebody black. I have, I'm prejudiced to that extent. I would like also that the youngsters I see in the schools every day, in whose eyes the absence of a positive, healthy concept gleams either as hostility or self-defeat and self-hatred, who either now are taking drugs or will shortly take drugs out of self-hatred for themselves, I would like to be able to give them some positive, healthy figure to say, here, black boys and girls, is a black man who was a master and a major and is worthy of your adoration and of your love and of your respect. Though he fought and died, he fought bravely. He fought for freedom. And he was worthy to be considered and included in the pantheon of heroes that we present to all mankind. If that hero comes into my family 
being motivated to the least degree by his love for a white woman, already there's an ambivalence that I must deal with. You don't have to perhaps deal with it, but I do. How do I deal with it? How? I need for, from Nat Turner and the facts of his history to make that thing which glorifies blackness in a society which is horrified by blackness. I wonder if Nat, in the book written by Mr. Saron, had loved a black woman, as some people said he was married to a black woman. I wonder if the book would have been as exciting to those of us who read it. I wonder to what degree we were not attracted by this taboo, this lascivious concept of the black, lecherous male reaching out to touch the forbidden flesh of the white maiden. That makes a stark picture, and it possibly to some perverted minds helped sell the book. Not to the literate, I'm sure, but to somebody. Let me sum up my argument, which is an emotional one, I assure you, because I respond to the situation emotionally. Let me sum up by saying, once again, that I respect Mr. Styron as an individual. I admire him as an individual for the things that I know that he's done. I respect his talent and his right to use that talent. That is, as long as he respects his own integrity, I respect his right to do that. I respect his right to write the book any way he wants to. But at the same time, the social consequences of a book do not necessarily always act out the good intentions of the writers themselves. If we in our country have decided that race and color are nonsensical, that these are things that are adventitious to the human condition and no longer need we concern ourselves with them, then I say to the book, all success. But if on the other hand, in our own hearts and minds, subconsciously we feel that it is of no consequence that a black man loves a black woman, and that we, we, we like to see our black heroes on our motion picture screens only when they are being helpful to white people, and that it doesn't concern us that when they are helpful to black people, because black people being helped do not matter. If we would still give to Hattie McDaniels an Oscar for her sterling performance as the wonderful mammy in Gone with the Wind when she portrayed the touching depth of human devotion to the little child, Rhett Butler and his wife, when she, when she cared so much that she was the structural supporting member of that family. If you and me and I, if we have not learned to ask yet whatever happened to Mammy's children of her own, who took care of them, wow. who gave them love, who f fixed their breakfast, who cared if they went to jail, if we cannot ask ourselves that about Mammy, if we cannot see that Mammy was a greater traitor to her race than that lunatic thing that was portrayed by Butterfly McQueen, then I fear we do not understand the situation we face in our country Bravo. and that we may, we may find ourselves being taught by experience that which I hope God grants in his wisdom we learn by discussion and by talk and by reasoning together. Because if the final confrontation faces us in our country, I am not sanguine about the results. If I have overreacted, I do not apologize. I will overreact as long as I am aware that racism is in our country and is a threat to me as a black man and that a black hero cannot honor a black woman like Leah Richards, or that Coretta King is not a woman of magnificence worthy of a black hero's going to his death, or that Medgar Evers' wife 
or that Malcolm X's wife were not women worthy of the heroic black men who stood by their sides and died for them and for their children, that our black leaders can prove their value to the American society only by aspiring to white womanhood. If I cannot believe that, then I see no, no way of my ever being able to accept the literary tradition even though genius spreads its tail for my delectation. I must choose to be a black man with all my defenses and all my inadequacies and all my yelling and all my screaming and all my emotionality. Because I've been a black man all these years and I cannot stop all of a sudden when, when my country has not stopped yet making me pay for that fact. Thank you. Ozzy Davis, you're listening to a discussion of the controversy surrounding William Styron's book, The Confessions of Nat Turner, with Ozzy Davis and William Styron himself, moderated by their mutual friend, James Baldwin. This is From the Vault, the original weekly series produced by the Pacifica Radio Archives. For a copy of this program or to browse the other programs in this series, go to fromthevaultradio.org or call us at 1-800-735-0200. And now, back to our program. Ozzy has done um, something very, very important. And that ironically enough proves that Bill has done something very, very important. It's a very real question. Ozzy is talking about human life. And what Ossie is saying, if I may do this for a moment, as the, the legends of which this country lives have nothing whatever to do, this is our danger, with the freedom of the artist or the freedom of the man. He's saying, well, I'm saying, I'm saying, It is not so much what Bill has written, which endangers the life of this republic. What endangers the life of this republic and the lives of his children and all our lives, all our lives in this room, all our lives in this country, is what we make of our real history. In fact, it is a nation based on genocide, genocide and slavery. Now, Bill has written his study of a slave insurrection from the master's point of view. No matter what I write until the day I die, I'll be writing from the slave's point of view. And the social consequences, which is what we're really talking about, of the private act, is the 20th century question, which is, the mo which is in this country, above all, is the most important question. It's a question of who we really are, what we really want, and really, whether or not we love ourselves enough to love our children. And Ossie is right to look on this, the abomination of desolation, because the most vivid thing about American life, the most vivid thing, is how little we love each other, and the state of our youth is an indictment against this culture, leaving aside everything else. The state, the state of our youth, black or white, this is the most unloved and loneliest country in the world. And we deserve our leaders. Ossie is saying, Ossie is saying he will not go along with it. And Bill is trying to interpret how we got here. Thank you. Next, we hear a rebuttal by author William Styron, who will reference a book criticising his novel. The book, edited by John Henry Clark, brought African-American writers, historians and literary critics together to attack the novel. The book, titled William Styron's Nat Turner, 
published the month following this talk, which systematically trashed the fictional and factual content of Styron's novel. Well, I, excuse me. <clears throat> I don't know how to... I don't mean to be facetious when I say that this is two hard acts to follow because this was eloquence and I'm, I feel very humble before it. Um, I don't know, again, I have the unique, I think almost, uh, stature in, in that I am the recipient of an attack by 10 Negro writers, uh, essays which are going to be collected in a book published by Beacon Press at your local bookstore next month. Um, it's an amazing volume. Makes me feel like Darwin or Freud or somebody. At least it has that. Uh, it's, again, without trying to stretch this out, as a measure of astonishing to me of, of, of what kind of bee's nest one can stir up. Um, I suppose one could, could write a whole book again on, on just what the relationship of history and art is. I don't know myself, and I don't want to repeat myself by saying that I was trying to create a, a hero thrusting myself into the skin of a black man, which it is, a, in a sense, presumptuous, but not really presumptuous, because if I cannot, if I cannot assume the the guise, the the skin of a black man, then this prevents black men from assuming the the guise and the skin of white men. And we are surely at an impasse if that if that exists. Um, I, I'm I'm rather. Um, in a sense, I'm, I'm rather relieved that, that Ossie uh, has only one uh, uh, thing to quarrel with about the book, the, namely the relationship between Nat Turner and, and Margaret Whitehead. Uh, m most of my other critics, and they are by and large uh, distinguished black men, um, run the whole panoply of... of, of uh, uh, historical error that I had distorted history by having that taught by uh, his white master instead of by uh, his parents as the records indicate or purportedly indicate and so on. Uh, <coughs> the indictments laid against the book are really quite astonishing. They are manifold. They go on and on and on. Um, I am finally relieved of any artistic, uh, I'm afraid, in, uh, within the framework of these 10 essays, of any artistic freedom whatsoever. And this gets me to a singular point, which Asi uh, touched upon when he said, and you know, our memories betray us. Um, when he said something like, just now, I want a hero who will represent something for my children, my black children. I want a hero who will, I'm paraphrasing again, I want a hero who will be representative of all that is noble, heroic, but all the good things and I'm not being ironic, in black people. Well, there's a, there's a terrible 
There's a terrible fact about Nat Turner which has to be faced. And I'm, I'm saying this here for, the fir I think, the first time, certainly in public. If we examine Nat Turner, or put it this way, if I were to make a public reading of the 5,000 word document called The Confessions of Nat Turner, published in 1831, uh, which is the uh, uh, jumping off point for all the criticism against the book, that is, where, where my book does not correspond to those so-called truths, which I say so-called because I believe even that document has, is questionable. If I were to give a reading here, it would take about 50 minutes, maybe an hour, no more. And then we're to pass out a questionnaire asking uh, each of you intelligent, receptive people uh, to tell me what kind of person emerged from this single document. And again, I'm jumping now because I can't swear to it because we haven't done this. I'm willing to bet that the image you would get out of this man would be a certainly gifted, enormously intelligent, but totally crazed, fanatical butcher. A man who had no strategy, had no in intellectual underpinning for what he did. A man who embarked upon an absolute crazy adventure of slaughter, killing 55 white people, rather ruthlessly, most of them helpless women and children, and whose total outcome was disaster. Now, I say this with great caution, but with conviction, because I believe it to be true in terms of the evidence. And I would wager that a jury faced with this evidence would come to that conclusion. Now, what I am saying is this. I studied hard and long this man's record, this man's story. And somewhere behind, I studied for 10 years or more. And I found somewhere deep within the lines the fact, or at least the notion, that this man was not this ruthless butcher, that he was something else, that he was what I said earlier on this evening, that he was a hero, that he was a man of enormous resilience, fantastic vision, who did indeed out of desperation, rise up in a kind of awesome nobility and grandeur and perform, like Martin Luther, that which he had to do. Now, I am only asking you to believe that it was art, and I hope I'm not sounding pretentious, that it was art, my art, which discovered 
what I truly believe to be the true nobility in this man and turned him into the liberator that I think he is in the book. Thank you. I think that's just about it. Very well done, Jim. Thank you. Uh, this will be my last statement, which I shall hope to be brief. I began my first statement to you with two presumptions, gross and egregious, that I felt in being in this position, and I shall close by telling you what the third presumption is. But before I do that, uh, one or two comments relating not necessarily to Mr. Styron's book, but to the uses of books in relations, in this instance, to black people in America. I've often wondered, I imagine you have too, how such an important book as Uncle Tom's Cabin, creating a character, Uncle Tom, who Mr. Lincoln said was one of the causes of the Civil War, should ultimately wind up being so despised and hated by the black people. Why did this happen? The, the Miss Stowe certainly had no, nothing, uh, no ax to grind against blacks. She was by no means a racist. Her intention really was to alleviate the conditions of the black men and women in our country. And yet somehow, Ultimately, we came to hate and despise Uncle Tom. There are two reasons, and they're relevant to what we're talking about tonight. One is that Uncle Tom, for all of his great values, was given to us and did not grow out of our own experience. We did not create him. He came from someone else. The second and far more subtle point was that Uncle Tom's characteristics were created basically to elicit the sympathy of the white community who had the power to do something about Uncle Tom's condition. This was because Uncle Tom couldn't do it himself. Now, we've had two kinds of heroes in our country, two kinds of black heroes, those who were modeled on Uncle Tom, those who did not have the power to change their condition, but had only the power by their own morality and their goodness and their sanctity to make white people guilty enough to change it that was one kind of hero, and there was the other kind, the outsider. The rebel, Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey, Gabriel Prosser, uh, guys like uh, Marcus Garvey, who organized more pe black people into political instrument than anybody else. The outsiders, the Malcolm X's, who never compromised, who never felt that the white man should be made to feel guilty, who never felt that they had to rely on white power for whatever it was that needed to be done. Now. In, our, in the black community now, there is a new thing happening. The black community has rejected the old terms of communication between the black community and the white community. The old images no longer work. The old language no longer holds water. What is really happening, and what is a part of what is good here tonight, is that the black community is speaking in a new language to which it hopes the white community will respond in a new fashion. Now the great trouble with the white liberal has always been not that he didn't like black folks, but that he was so intelligent, so knowledgeable, so full of the answers and the statistics that he didn't have to listen to what the black man's question was. And before we ask the question, he's often running with the solution. And finally it comes to this, wait, damn it, and let me ask you the question. Don't understand me too soon because my manhood is involved with what you do to save my life. You must help me, if you will, get into a position to do it myself. This is the stage in which we find ourselves now. Those in our communities in the past who have been helpful have found a response from that kind of leadership that we had, the accommodationist leadership, who never relied on the power of the black people ever to get what black people needed to get. We always had to rely on the good intentions of whites. 
In order to merit that good intentions, we created a language, we created an attitude, we created a thing of ourselves which was not quite a man because that we could not get the job done. We modeled ourselves on Uncle Tom because it was a necessity of survival. That aspect of our existence in this country is over and done with. Black people will stand and be counted as men, no better, no worse than other men, or they will die. They will no longer accept any kind of accommodation that does not recognize in the beginning their rights to stand up as men. One of the things that I object to about Bill Siren's uh, Nat Turner is that a white man gave it to me in the first place. Now this is irrational and yet perfectly logical and perfectly true and perfectly necessary for me at this moment and leads me to what I say is my third presumption in discussing this book with you tonight. The third and most profound presumption with which I am burdened is if I love Nat so much and my kids needed him, why the hell didn't I spend five years and write my Nat Turner before Bill Styron wrote his Nat Turner, right? I think this is an intelligent question, and I have to say that to some degree I am guilty of not having done it. I think I could write a Nat Turner. I could make my own statement about him. Why then have I not done it? I won't go into the reasons why. They have to do with my position in this society all this time. But a part of the discussion tonight, I hope will leave in all of our minds that the black community is determined now to not only create its own black heroes and its own Nat Turners and to use its own instrumentalities to establish its own identity, but will even bite the hand that feeds us in order to establish the right to do that. And we're not the first to have done this, nor will we be the last. Jesus Christ was once a Jewish boy. You might have forgotten that. Now those of you who worship him as a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Jesus, but he was taken by one culture and made into another culture hero because they needed him so desperately. And in Detroit, Michigan, Jesus is undergoing another kind of acculturation. He's being made into a black Jesus because the black ghetto says we're going to have a black Jesus, and they're going to have him. The artistic sensitivities of the people will rise to create what they need out of the bare bones of the facts of the truth. Otherwise, art would not be necessary. We cannot yet live with the truth or the facts. It is what we do with them that determines what we are as peoples. Mr. Styron, I think, honestly expressed what he needed to express growing out of his situation in a culture that he and his people created. He did not feed me something that I culturally need, and there is no way that he could do it in reality. Now, this has nothing to do with his capacity to get inside the hide of Nat Turner. Of course he can do that. All this requires is artistic sympathy and artistic empathy and communion. He may suffer from the fact that we live a dual life in our country, especially black men. We are what gets along well in the white world because we survive at that. But when your backs are turned, sometimes we are something quite different because we have to survive as what we also are. We are split apart by this dichotomy. And I think we will no longer be split apart. That if in our anguish to come to full manhood, if in our desire to assume cultural control of our own communities, we are boorish, and loud and clamorous and write 10 essays if we make all the mistakes in the world we claim our right so to do and you should be proud that at long last all of these helpless colored folks who are always around you with petitions and flags and placards are going to stop coming to your community and going to stand up and take the responsibility to rebuild themselves in whatever image they see fit to make of themselves and I must say, with, it, with the images floating around now, it may be that we will, out of our needs, create something that you will have to take 10 years from now. Thank you very kindly. Um, all I can say is I'm hopelessly smitten by a statement like that, and it's absolute truth, and I'm humbled by it, and maybe there's nothing much more to say, really. 
Uh, I'll I'll turn it over to Jimmy Baldwin, hoping for the l'envoi. I really have nothing to say at all. I hope the people here are aware, for the sake of the life of this country and for all the lives of the people in this room, that you just heard two extraordinarily courageous men. Thank you.